welcome everybody to our second in the series. Uh, Cindy, make sure I get it right. So support for caregivers. That's CSA right. It's <laughs> part of uh, Craig's Cause Pancreatic Cancer Society's presentation. Uh, I'm Dr. Rob Rutledge. I'm an oncologist and associate professor of medicine. My passion, however, is empowering people on the cancer journey. And um, today I want to talk to you about something that's extremely important, uh, and that is this idea of integrative medicine, getting the best care from the medical system and how you combine that uh, to help your loved one, uh, loved as a body, mind, and spirit. Um, and so I'm just going to launch right into this presentation, uh, realizing, first of all, I just want to honor people that it is extremely difficult to be that loved one. Um, I call them the family member. Some people call them the supporter or the caregiver. Um, but we know that, you know, being that person beside the person with a cancer diagnosis is extremely stressful. You know, lots of emotional turmoil. It's really difficult thing to do. And so I really want to empower you with this knowledge and essentially the attitude as well around how you can get the best care for your loved one and how you can make a real difference. And one of the real meta messages is that you, you really need to take care of yourself. It is the foundation for being a good family member, caregiver, however you want to say that. And so I really want to try to empower you with the knowledge now, but also just prod you to take care of yourself. So incredibly important. Okay, so here's the presentation. Um, thank you to Craig's Cause. Really appreciate this opportunity. I'd love to present and empower people. What we want to do is talk uh, for the first maybe 45 minutes um, on the lecture itself and get people up and stretch uh, for a few minutes and then we'll have a kind of connection sharing strength session at uh, the end here. So recognize uh, that your role is to empower that person. Your role is to empower your loved one with a diagnosis. And what do we want? It's pretty obvious. You want to maximize the chance of recovery. And if that's not in the cards, then it's essentially longevity. And you do that by uh, following what uh, I'm about to explain. Um, as, my, as my perspective as an oncologist with 25 plus years experience, secondly, recognize that you're in the same boat as essentially your loved one. You're both, it's like really difficult, really suffering uh, emotionally in lots of different, different, different ways. So, we want our loved ones to feel better. And interestingly, the last one I, I found out is that we want our loved one to be able to think more clearly and to function better. And so this is all part of it. it. You know, when you get the best care from the medical system, when you look out for those side effects, when you empower levels of body, mind, and spirits, both your loved one and yourself, then you get that functionality and you are able to experience the joys of life even more. And I guess I use the analogy that you also want to be paddling in the same direction as your loved one. How to do that so so how do, what's the what's the big picture how, what are the components and i see it as kind of five pillars one is to be able to understand you know having that perspective of uh, seeing big picture what your role is what your loved one's role is what the medical system can do what can do beyond medical system so it's this kind of comprehensive picture like being in the control tower of, uh, you know, when the airplane takes off versus being in the back seat and rumbling along and not knowing what's happening. So information is power and it really decreases the stress levels. And then as we're going to go through today, there's a whole set of skills that go along with, you know, advocating, getting the care, understanding, having those conversations with the medical system. And then I break it down into what I call complementary or integrative part of it is empowering the body. How, do, how can you facilitate that one in your loved one and in, in yourself? There's the level of the mind, like stress reduction, um, you know, recognizing that your brain, you've been given this brain, how you work with the brain and the mind in order to facilitate healing. And ultimately, it's also about nurturing a spiritual perspective. Uh, where do you find meaning? What do you value most? What counts for you? Um, and if you can bring even those higher principles, those Kind of love and wisdom into your life and how you do these other things is extremely important. Okay, and I recognize it's difficult because there's no one west best way to do this and that you're kind of one step removed from the most difficult stuff even though it's extremely stressful for you. 
and there's this kind of spectrum from, you know, maybe within the relationship, you know, there are times when you're going to do absolutely everything. You really have to take care of that person. And there may be situations or personalities in which you're asked to be the bystander. And so it, there's a spectrum of how you can interact and be that best loving supporter. Um, and there's no one right way on that side. Each relationship is different. And it may fluctuate. You know, you may be the information gatherer and, uh, you know, play that key part within the medical system. And so you're the key person to kind of guide that process. You know, within the home life scenario, you know, there could be different roles. You know, your loved one may, may want to still kind of maintain their strength and position within the family. And just think about all the other things that you do, you know, the other family members, the other friends, uh, you know, the social worlds, the work worlds, and how we recognize that our roles can change and be different along that spectrum that I've uh, listed above there. Uh, and the fact is different things happen. You go through a major surgery, you know, your loved one goes through a major surgery and, you know, they can be very dependent at that point or they're having severe side effects from chemotherapy. Uh, again, they can be quite debilitated and you have to kind of step up your game in order to kind of take care of it. There, there are different phases that can happen here. And to have that kind of flexibility in the kind of meta consciousness to say, well, what is needed? How can I serve? What's, what serves the biggest purpose, the best purpose in the situation? And then I think, and I'm, it's my philosophy, is that the person with a cancer diagnosis is the one who decides how it's going to run out. We bystanders, however you want to say that, loved ones, family members, caregivers, are fitting into their, their request. And sometimes they're requesting that explicitly, uh, right? Please help me in this way or don't help me in this way. Or if there's no communication, if it's just, you know, the business as usual, you know, you have always done the, the books and finances. You've always done the medical information stuff. And there's no conversation, but there's kind of this understanding that, you know, you're taking a, a fair brunt of, uh, of the workload. And what I would suggest is to bring that to consciousness, to actually have the conversation. Dear loved one, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to best serve the situation? Going into this medical scenario, um, you know, what do you want me to do when we're with the physician? Or, you know, all the friends and family members are, you know, knocking at the door. How do you want me to... You know, do I want to, should I be the gatekeeper to those situations? And so it's better to have the open conversation to realize that there's a, there's a partnership there and you're better to be working together and understand the rules together and that that can shift as well. So continue to have those conversations. It's like, I, I think of the analogy of um, going down a canoe in a, a kind of rougher river. And so you, both people want to be, paddling in the same directions and to recognize that there are going to be times where it's turbulent, right? There's, you know, the rapids and avoiding the rocks, et cetera, et cetera. And there are times when it's going to be very calm and peaceful and you both can kind of sit back, relax and go, Oh, this is, you know, this lovely environment right now. And so having that open conversation allows that, you know, the function of that team the team is extremely important there. Okay. No one right way. That's the other thing. It's not like, um, you know, you should do this. Here are the rules of being the family member, the caregiver. Um, the strategies work different with different personalities. Some people want to be in control. You might want to, you might understand that your, your loved one, the person with diagnosis wants to be in control. And so you look for those opportunities. You know, you, you, you ask the question, you know, what, what do you want to do in this situation, honey? Or whatever it is that you know, empowers uh, that person to serve them, to, you know, want their happiness. I also believe that what we're doing here is using both the kind of a rational perspective, the scientific, logical part of your brain, what needs to happen. But there's a whole level of intuition and wisdom uh, uh, that we tap into. And that happens both within you and within your loved one with the diagnosis. Um, and so we use both of those sides to try to make our decisions and to follow the directions because you never know what life is going to present in terms of some healing opportunity. Uh, and so to use that and obviously 
things change. Uh, recognize sometimes you got to be hyper rational. Sometimes you have to follow your gut. That's what, what you feel is best. Okay, so if we take it back up to the highest level, I'd say getting information is the number one um, um, process. Uh, puts you in a position where it can actually have a conversation with your medical practitioners because they, they speak in garbled jargon, they don't even know it. Uh, and so if you understand what metastasis mean or understand what you know, uh, transplant or chemotherapy, or, so you have this kind of images and concepts going into the conversation allows you to kind of absorb and then ask the right questions. So super important. And it just, it's an empowerment piece that gives a sense of proactivity. To see the truth is very powerful. To work with the truth at the start and in each phase is the starting point to make good decisions. Um, and then there's obviously, I'm trying to empower you that it's something beyond just being a receptacle of physical medical care. There are ways that you can actually, you personally feel better and your loved one can feel better uh, by empowerment. You know, the, there's always a tension, right? Of between tension between like doing nothing, like not knowing, and being completely out to lunch during the medical appointments, and then also just like too much, pushing yourself too hard, burning yourself out, and not not kind of trusting uh, the medical system to help you make a good decision. So, so if you're in that phase where uh, you're getting tired, you're you know, not you're losing sleep because you're doing too much research, or you know, the other one that happens is you, you know, read these studies and say, well, why can't we have this that's conflicting with what the physician is saying? So you're getting conflicting information, and that's the point where you need the kind of clarification. But ultimately, I want you to get to the point where you do feel kind of centered and feeling, yes, I'm doing what I can. I'm not having an influence on what I can. I'm letting go of the things I can't control. That's, that's the position. That's the trust position. That's the center position that we want to work towards. So, uh, so we understand cancer in the medical system, and I want to just give you some kind of practical advice uh, on that side. Ultimately, you're trying to work with your physician, your surgeon, your uh, oncologist, because they have like huge amounts of experience. They're tapping into the international um, guidelines. You know, they're, they're focused on the kind of highest level science, physical care, and they're tailoring that information to that situation, your situation, your loved one's situation. So you know, ultimately that's, that's the conversation that you, you need to have. But you prepare for the conversation because there are points within that journey where you're gonna be asked, you and your loved one are gonna be asked what you wanna do. Should you do the chemo now, maybe not, maybe later, those type of questions. Um, and so to understand puts you in a position to have that conversation. Lots of different sources. Um, Canadian Cancer Society offers an info line, which kind of gives the kind of big information in terms of uh, the pancreatic cancer treatments, et cetera, et cetera. But there are lots of great websites. I'd also go to, you know, the, the Craig's Cause websites of the world and find out what, what the information they have there. So the not-for-profits are the, are the key person. The other one is, you can go to the librarian at the hospital or the cancer center and they can create a, a printout or they can help guide you in terms of the quality, the type of information, what, what information you might need. So I'm always going to say to you, go to an expert, see an expert uh, in the journey. Um, then the kind of the, so that's the kind of preparation phase. And then I'd say again, this sense of attitude and the skills so you're preparing beforehand and you're advocating for yourself and your loved one. If you have questions, concerns, something isn't quite sitting right, you need to keep on asking. You need to get that information. I really highly endorse being a proactive participant. The fact is the medical system has a whole bunch of extra services as well. I'm going to discuss with you. Um, and uh, if you don't ask, you won't necessarily get it. It's like the physicians forget, so you need to ask about it. And we can, we can briefly talk about this idea of a second opinion. Uh, so again, if you're feeling like something's conflicting, and especially if you're not getting the information you need from your oncologist or your surgeon, then you can ask for a second opinion. How do you do that? 
you talk to that surgeon or oncologist nurse and say, oh, I'm just not feeling quite right. Can you please you know, refer me on to a second person? And really, this is such a key point. It's not about your oncologist or surgeon's ego. It's about the quality of care that you're getting. You, are the mo- you and your loved one are the most important person in the room. And so it's really important to keep advocating for yourself. Now, I, I don't think most people don't need a second opinion, but if you need a second opinion, go to the nurse who works with that person or go to your family physician and say, I just don't feel right. Communication is there. I don't, I'm not fully trusting this. Can, can I talk with somebody? Yes, you're likely to get to refer to a different oncolog- oncologist in the same center. They are following the same set of kind of guidelines based on scientific data, but at least you can maybe get somebody to communicate that more clearly with you and create a greater sense of uh, trust in that process. Okay, so then what's the practicality uh, of this? How does this happen um, you know, on the day-to-day? You're going into a medical appointment. What do you need to do beforehand? One, be clear about what the symptoms are, right? What's the story? Have that clear outline. In fact, oftentimes people can create a little printout of their medical situation and kind of hand that over to the nurse and oncologist and kind of speeds things along. Now, the other kind of thing that I see as an oncologist is uh, you know, we have a couple in there. One has a cancer diagnosis. One is the, the family member. And I'm starting to ask some questions. And, the, you know, the person with the diagnosis gives a few answers. And then the family member is jumping in and kind of correcting or adding to it, et cetera, et cetera. I appreciate that because I'm getting kind of two opinions in one. But it can really frustrate the person with the cancer diagnosis. There can be kind of some tension there. So what I would say is have a conversation beforehand ask your loved one, the person with the cancer diagnosis, you know, you know, can I, you know, volunteer some, you know, symptoms that I see that, you know, I'm seeing something different than you are. And typically a person would agree to that, but it's good to have that kind of conversation uh, beforehand. Bring a list of the current medications and allergies. That's part of the kind of treatment summary. Um, I really think it's important to write down the questions beforehand. And there's another opportunity for you to have more of a leadership role within your team of two, uh, right? Because you want, because what happens is uh, people often feel stressed and nervous and they can't think as clearly during the appointment. And uh, then they can also be picking up vibes from their oncologist or surgeon that they're very busy and, you know, we don't want to irritate them. And so therefore we're less likely to ask those questions. You have to break out of that attitude the idea is you are the most important person in the room. Stay there and get your questions answered. Now, typically, the, the phases of the appointment are the oncologist will uh, you know, hear out your story. They'll examine you. They'll create a summary of what's happened. They'll suggest a plan of action. There may be some little conversation around some choices there. And typically, through those phases, especially the latter phases of the interaction, the physician will answer a lot of your questions. So you don't have to answer, ask your question right off the bat. Wait till the end, and then you'll be able to cross off many of the questions on your list, but definitely stay until your questions are answered. You have to stay and get that information. I mean, it, it's possible that there's not enough time, and you know, if it's really that stressful in terms of time, you can ask for another appointment or ask for a time when you can call. Uh, it's more convenient. But I think it's really important to have your questions answered and to feel that sense of you know, being settled by the end of it. Now, going in as well, uh, decide who is going to record the visit. Like, are you the you know, chief secretary uh, of this visit? You know, do you want to have a third person there? It's you know, more the merrier that is the way I see it. Uh, more ears hear more. Um, you can record the visit, visit both um, both. Uh, like written, or you can ask your physician, do you mind if you record it? And if you're going to record it, you can typically um, uh, you know, wait to record in the, the, the latter phases where the physician is going to summarize what's happening and the plan. So you don't have to record the whole thing. Um, and lastly, I would, I would advocate that you uh, create some type of file. Uh, essentially, it's your medical record that contains all your test results and uh, all that information, and you carry that with you into the into the visit, 
Um, and because the medical system is a human institution, they often will misplace information. And so sometimes they're, you know, we as oncologists, nurses are scrambling to try to find this information. If you come in with the information, it makes our job easier and we're certainly grateful for it. You can get a copy of your entire record. I mean, it's, uh, it's a legal right to have a full copy. Um, uh, but usually there's a medical records department. They'll charge you 50 bucks or you know, something outrageous to photocopy your chart, but at least you can get that. Or you go to your family doctor and get it one at a time, the, the piece of information. I do uh, endorse uh, this part of it. Okay, so during the visit itself, um, I think it's important that there's a sense of kind of honesty and being clear about what the goals are and what you want and what's actually happening. Do not put on a brave face. It's better just to tell the truth exactly as it is, right? If, if that person's suffering in pain, we don't want to say, oh, it's not that bad. You want to say, no, this is about how my pain is and I want some help with it. The other one is kind of this mindfulness piece of um, if you're uh, feeling overwhelmed, this, this is like you're speaking in the high level language and too fast and it's too confusing. The point is to be able to say something like, uh, just a second here, I'm not sure I understand what's happening. Can you please repeat this in simpler language? Right? So you're going to slow down your physician and make it more clearly communicable. Or you can ask your, your loved one with the diagnosis, are you understanding what's happening here? You know, or you know, that type of thing where you can kind of clarify the information, ask them to slow down, ask them to talk in simple language. And as I said, as I said before, you can wait till the end to ask all your questions, take notes and record it. This is the important part, right? Uh, find out what to expect. And that can be, um, uh, you know, both in terms of what, what can happen in the future. What do you expect over the next month, two, three, four months? What's going to happen? It can also be, if we start this treatment, what are the side effects? What to watch out for? So you want to have this kind of a better vision of what's going to happen in the future. Sometimes the oncologists are trying to paint a rosier picture. It's really important just to say, Doc, I need to hear this very clearly. Like, the more blunt and clear you are, the easier it is for your physician to tell you the truth. Uh, and so I think find out what to expect. And even with each side effect, you know, if I you know, get this rash, what do I do? Or if I get this abdominal pain, what do I do? You know, how bad does it need to be? Uh, when do I need to act? Who should I call? Who do I call at 3 a.m.? It's probably the other one. But you, you need to know who is on your team in the midst of uh, the night. Okay, so then afterwards, uh, I like this idea again of having that list of results, keeping the journal, uh, so you're updating your questions, having that conversation uh, with your loved one. If need be, you know, if, it's, if there are multiple people who are shopping to find out what's, what's happening and it's hard for you and your loved one to explain it, you can ask for a family conference or bring more people into the next visit so it's easier for you not to have to try and explain things. Now, uh, occasionally there's this kind of friction between the oncologist and the person with the diagnosis and uh, you or somebody else may be able to do the talking, you may be able to kind of be the mediator of the information gathering and so on. So you're doing more of the talking the appointment. Again, I think that's important to bring the consciousness within your, your uh, partnership of two going into this. And again, squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you know, you're not feeling, mm, don't quite know what's happening, what, you know, what are, what are the, what's the meaning of this, then call. What usually happens is that the nurses will receive those calls and they'll call you back and they, they have about like 95 plus percent of the information. They're really good at kind of clarifying and making sure you understand what's happening. If they don't, if they're uncomfortable in any way, then they'll have the physician call you back, uh, right? So, you know, you're not going to be bothering the physician every time. You've got a team there that can help answer many of the uh, more uh, straightforward questions. And you're entitled to a second opinion, as we talked about, if you're really, things are really uh, difficult. Okay. So that's the kind of classic, you know, going into the medical system and the empowerment piece in each of those sides. But the point is that there are other um, opportunities within the medical system. So other services. And I would recommend everybody with a pancreatic cancer diagnosis 
to go in and talk with a nutritionist or a dietitian, right? You, at each phase, I'd say you see the expert, see the person who knows best, and your physician may forget to make that referral, or the system may be flawed in that they're not making that referral. They're not empowering you at a very straightforward uh, level. Um, all sorts of stuff. We have spiritual care, powder care, lots of team members. If you ask, you know, anybody can help with this pain situation or, you know, that type of thing. So it, uh, you can get a referral to the right person. I often think about the social work of being able to coordinate many of the uh, different um, activities. Um, and, uh, you know, just they, they understand the system. They can tap into financial resources, medical uh, drug payments, et cetera, et cetera. So lots, lots of opportunity. If, you're, if, you're, if you are suffering, you know, you know really struggling uh, emotionally, you know, having difficulties making decisions, you know, just kind of melting down, it's really important that you also identify that within yourself and, you know, reach out. Almost always, there's uh, almost like a walk-in type of social work situation at the cancer center, or you can call the cancer center, you can talk to your family doctor, you can find resources out in the community. If you want to be the best person uh, to help your loved one with the diagnosis, then take care of yourself and to recognize when, when you're having a difficult time. So it's not weakness, that's actual strength and power to take care of yourself. So you can always ask your nurse or doctor about, you know, if there's a particular symptom or problem, uh, ask them if there's something extra that can be done or a different specialist or a different team member. Okay, always talk to an expert. All right, so um, at this phase, I wanted to um, recognize that what we're trying to facilitate in our love one with a diagnosis is actually what we need to facilitate within ourselves. So if you want to be the best possible caregiver, family member, uh, you need to take care of yourself. And it's paradoxical because I know you're, you know, you're there for your loved one. You want to give, 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 give. But the foundation is to put your own oxygen mask on first. And so uh, and just even having some psychological away time, uh, you know, when you go out to, you know, for instance, number one is exercise. Uh, you know, find a way to kind of get the heart rate up, a little sweat on the brow. Uh, you know, it might be a time when, uh, you know, you invite along um, uh, a friend or uh, someone else who, who can kind of listen to you out. It's like the power walk is the kind of perfect multitask, right? So you get to kind of get that heart rate out, burn off the stress levels, change the chemistry in your brain so you can feel better. And you can talk with your loved one, uh, you know, the, non-diagnosis person uh just tell them you know just say look uh, you don't need to help me you don't need to give me advice i just want to tell you how i'm feeling and just lay it on the line and tell your truth and it's, it is therapeutic by itself so exercise is number one how do you facilitate with that within your loved one you know just look for those opportunities that are easy things to stretch the body we know that even just getting out of bed uh you know, you know going from sitting to standing, you know, it has, you know, stretching, it just, it has so many benefits, um, you know, even so for somebody who's very weak. So there's lots of different ways um, exercise helps. We know that diet uh, is another one, and especially people with a pancreatic cancer diagnosis, there's where the expertise comes in. Um, you have an opportunity to take care of yourself, empower yourself, but it's, it's a, a venue where the two of you can work together kind of empower the body so super important on that side for yourself maintaining a reasonable weight uh, through this um, there's a whole kind of science around uh, sleep hygiene right what are the ways that you can facilitate a better night's sleep uh, and so you can help your loved one do this uh, so for instance um, so you can't force yourself to sleep, but you can create the conditions in which you're more likely to get a better night's sleep. And so you're thinking about the cooler room that's dark, you're wearing some eye patches, making sure the, it's blinded. Um, and then probably the easier one as well is um, avoiding the stimulation, avoiding the, the things that you know, stop you from falling asleep. So the late night, uh, screen time, definitely want to stay away from that. 
you know, uh, TV, video, computer, internet, emails, all that stuff, at least an hour and a half beforehand. You want to you read a paper book instead of that. Avoid the, the caffeines, the chocolates, the exercises, the, the jarring stuff, the, you know, arguments, you know, with that hour and a half to go. Um, you know, 3 a.m. wake up, what do you do? You can practice a relaxation technique uh, to help yourself go back to bed. Try to stay in the dark. So even 90 seconds of bright light can inhibit uh, melatonin and the healthy hormones. So you're looking for opportunities. I also believe in napping. So you can nap uh, prior to 5 p.m. Even 50 minutes at a time can help uh, replenish the, the sleep debt. So sleep and thinking about, I mean, you can learn this, right? This is another empowerment piece of what you can do. Have that conversation with, with your loved one with the diagnosis you know, what is it that we can do so you get a better night's sleep and it changes the healthy hormones. And lastly, I'd say practicing some type of relaxation exercise or a meditation where you kind of let that chattering mind settle, you reset what I call the stressometer. So instead of running on super tense and anxious all day long, you actually settle yourself down and be a more peaceful, positive state. Uh, so again, practicing that kind of meditation or qigong, tai chi, yoga, anywhere, anything where you're kind of bringing your attention back to the moment. Again, a little bit of investment here can make a huge difference uh, in the long term. Okay, so that's, I mean, what I've talked about so far is the, the kind of um, classic integrative medicine between uh, the, the mind and body and what you can do. And that's you know, really well uh, researched and part of the medical system now. Um, I do want to talk about complementary medicine as the next uh, idea because people with pancreatic cancer, we know that at least 60% of people will uh, you know, delve into uh, some type of complementary alternative medicine. And um, again, you empower yourself uh, and making sure you're making good decisions around that. So, um, and again, it's my perspective as an oncologist. You, you don't have to agree with me. Uh, you might find something that works really well for you. And if you believe it's working well and, you know, helping, then you know, hats off to you. That's what counts most. So I can just offer you my perspective, use what makes sense to you. So, so again, bottom line is it's a understand, use your rational mind to try to figure out what um, is helpful, what's logical, what makes sense, what's the evidence, right? You're using, you know, because that has to be part of the, the critical decision-making. And then you're balancing that off against following something that's innate, the deep wisdom within you that wants you and your loved one to heal, right? So following that intuition, being able to quiet your mind so you can follow that intuition. So that's the first principle. You're using both logic and intuition. I recommend, especially if you're taking anything by mouth or IV, uh, I 100% tell you, you need to tell your physician what you're taking. It's because there are possible interactions in lots of different ways, it's really important that you're, you're open and honest about this. They may not like it. You may decide not to take their advice, but at least you're getting the information about from their perspective. And I will talk to you about some of the possible... Uh, interactions here. Lastly, I'd say don't forego the proven treatments. Um, and the, so the difference between complementary, which is you're integrating that into the medical system and alternative, you're using the alternatives are the um, uh, something uh, against the medical system, or outside of the medical system. What I'm trying to endorse is complementary and not to replace the medical system. Okay, so conventional medicine, um, you know, we have this thing called the scientific method. Essentially, we want evidence, we want proof, we want to know what the toxicities are, uh, what the benefits are. We're trying to figure out cost versus benefit uh, with each decision. And you can see your physician and the medical system as part of the, the larger, you know, pie of healing. And so... You can see your physician as the person who's going to administer that. Or you can see them as a consultant. At least you're going to get the information from them. What I'd say is you're not missing the home run. There's, there's no snake oil, Asiac, shark cartilage out there 
that you should be taking or your loved one should be taking for a pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Uh, and I wouldn't have felt so confident about that when I first presented this 20 years ago, but the, uh, the major cancer centers, uh, the scientists have worked very, very, very hard to look at the quality of evidence, both kind of in test tube and uh, you know, uh, in the population with people to see if there's something that could you know, increase the chance of cure and so on. And there's no big home run. Now, as again, I, I, as I said before, you know, for a particular individual, it might be something that is the home run for them. But I, I just don't think we should be recommending anything because there's no proof is the kind of takeaway. What we can say is that there are many complementary therapies that really do improve quality of life, decrease symptoms, and so on. And, uh, you know, it, I think it can improve longevity and kind of happiness and it gives a sense of proactivity and you know, you connect with a complementary medicine practitioner and they spend the time and healing can occur at much, much deeper levels beyond what's happening on a CAT scan or an x-ray. So I do endorse this idea of seeing complementary medicine as part of the healing journey. So strongly endorse that side of it. This is uh, from Linda Belneves, who's a, basically a PhD nurse who basically studied uh, complementary medicine. She's from the University of British Columbia. And um, so she shared her slides and here's the kind of, uh, you know, kind of international kind of guideline standards around some of these complementary medicines. So the touch, the massages, uh, body-based kind of touch therapy uh, has been proven to improve pain and anxiety. We do worry about, uh, you know, lymphedema uh, in certain situations. It can be helpful there. It doesn't apply to the pancreatic world. Um, so bottom line is, uh, within pancreatic cancer, it's, it's a very nice, uh, healing modality. Um, I've touched on this already, the benefits of, uh, fitness and uh, exercise. The, the idea is to try to get up to kind of 30 minutes a day, five days a week is, is the optimal. Again, I don't think this should be a tension between you and your loved one with the cancer diagnosis. Like you shouldn't be like irritated because they're not following the prescription uh, or not following what you believe is the best way to go. Your role is to support, uh, you know, you can expose them to this information, but I don't think there should be an expectation or um, some type of pressure, um, you know, subtle or not, uh, around doing those things. Uh, resistance training has now been integrated into this 150 minutes per week. So you know, twice per week, 30 minutes a day, you're doing you know, eight to 10 sets, two, sorry, two sets of eight to 10 reps uh, using different muscle groups within the body. Again, seeing a specialist, uh, like a certified exercise physiologist would be quite helpful there. Okay, so I do strongly endorse that. And I've already gone through the kind of physical side of that. So then there are the mind-body uh, techniques, right? So visualization, I do believe in this as well, that our consciousness or energy, uh, the healing field can have an influence on the body's function. And so, uh, you know, though I can't promise cure, I do know that it, it does improve a whole number of symptoms. Um, and people are happier, they sleep better, have more energy, you know, through these techniques. I happen to like the techniques in which you as the individual are the one that is doing it. You're not kind of reliant on some other healer to do this for you. I think we all have that capacity and it's, there's something empowering about doing it for yourself as well. Some really good biofeedback things, uh, you know, practicing a meditation technique using a biofeedback machine uh, is very powerful. So, and a few little cautions there that you can see on uh, the slide as well. It's pretty, pretty minimal. Uh, energy healing. So the idea is that uh, we're actually beings of energy, uh, that, that energy is concentrated in different chakras within the body itself, and that by uh, moving the energy that could be like a, you know, too much energy in one spot or a deficiency in another, it could be a block, that moving that energy allows the body to um, you know, release that and uh, unleash the, um, uh, the kind of healing potential. We do have a kind of healing potential within the body and doing that psychological, spiritual work, emotional work, uh, and oftentimes that's facilitated through energy therapies, can release, release those blocks and allow 
the natural healing to occur. So again, I, I endorse energy therapies, but not to sort of, but not bio, uh, uh, electromagnetic. So not going into an energy field or a magnet. I mean, there's no, no proof that that actually helps. Um, so acupuncture. So we, you know, so far I've been talking within the context of Western medicine. Uh, and the idea again is the, uh, acupuncture specialists are regulating the flow of chi energy or vital energy. And they use different ways of kind of, um, uh, releasing those, those energy flows. And there's some really good neuroscience showing it actually changes the chemistry of their brain and our perception of pain and so on. So really some very, very interesting uh, work there. So if you're inclined, it seems like it's a good idea. Quick joke, the elephant saying to himself, that's odd, my neck suddenly feels better. Acupuncture, so it's recommended. So we know that it can, can help with, like the randomized trial showing can uh, help with pain and nausea, uh, chemotherapy, can help with hot flushes, uh, dry mouth. Um, so again, and there's a few little uh, cautions uh, here. All right, now I think a lot of people are attracted to the natural health products. Uh, so the vitamins and minerals, um, and uh, a lot of people are using it. So again, there's no home run um, you know, product. And I just wanna give you a few little warnings to you know, make sure you're clear of mind. So um, I would, again, best to see a specialist of a naturopath, somebody who's got uh, a lot of training, who's tapping into the scientific uh, um, information as best as possible. So, and actually there's a good point there at the bottom. Dietary supplements are usually unnecessary. Again, speaking with your dietitian or nutritionist, people with pancreatic cancer may have problems absorbing, so therefore they might need specialized uh, help on that side. Um, but here's the deal. The naturopathic products can influence a whole bunch of different things, including you know, creating too much of blood thinning or damage to the liver, changing how the, the, uh, the drugs, uh, you know, the chemotherapy drugs are um, metabolized. So we have to be careful. You know, this, is, this is where you have to be very cognizant and have an expert and, and tell your physician, your, your oncologist, what's uh, happening. So what's the fuss? You know, the idea is that uh, through chemotherapy and radiation that uh, it creates chemicals in the body called free radicals that are able to do the damage that kill the cancer cells, right? And so if you have an antioxidant on board, it can kind of mop up those free radicals and mop up these chemicals and you lose the effectiveness of the treatment. Now that's probably like more theoretical than real, but it's certainly... Um, you know, that is the worry. Uh, and there are some, there is some data here that I'm kind of showing on the slide that there are different types of uh, antioxidant examples, like the healed coenzyme Q10, green tea, grape, uh, grape, grape seed abstract. And yes, it may reduce some toxicities, uh, but you'll see on the right hand side that there are some actual trials that show, for instance, uh, you know, vitamin A and E had increased mortality. Um, you know, beta carotene increased cancer incidence. And if you know a, a, a medication or a habit puts a person at risk of uh, cancer, you want to eliminate that habit if you get that type of cancer. So, for instance, people are smokers, uh, they want to stop smoking after getting a pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Um, and there are, are concerns about uh, that. Um, yeah, that'd be wonderful. So I'm just in the middle, thank you for joining us, Aaron, just at the end of uh, the talk here on, on natural health products. Um, and uh, so just worrying about the blood thinning uh, capacity um, uh, of different types of medications that you're, I've uh, outlined uh, there below. Um, and uh, that certain of those medications can actually cause damage to the liver itself. And so uh, we have to be quite careful of not kind of overdosing or certainly be watching the liver function carefully if we're going to take uh, something extra like that. 
Um, uh, and then, Cindy, can you tell me if uh, there's little um, windows? Yes, yes, it is there. <clears throat> how we can eliminate that. Hopefully that will disappear now. Okay, good. Or, or no, maybe not. It seems to come and go. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how that works. Okay. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just escape from here. And then at least it won't block the, um, uh, the slide. Okay. So bottom line is natural health products can cause different side effects. Um, and um, you have to be aware of that. But I guess the last one is if you're going to take something extra, what, uh, how are you going to monitor that? What, what's the stopping point? What's the starting point? How do you know it's successful? Uh, and so I think the key point here is that there needs to be a plan between you and the comp uh, complementary medicine practitioner. Length of time, how we evaluate uh, a written summary of all this. And then to revisit those decisions, uh, you know, at some point in time, you know, it will take this for three months and we'll reconsider it uh, later. I've added some credible uh, websites. So it's CAM is Complementary and Alternative, alternative Medicines. Uh, and you can pick that up off uh, the video that we're going to share uh, with folk. And just, and the last one is just a cautionary tale of um, uh, recognizing that, you know, people that can a cancer diagnosis are more vulnerable to trying things that may not be helpful at all. And especially if, you know, it's expensive or the practitioners are making unproven or false claims. Nowadays, there's a better kind of uh, library, kind of a black book uh, of naturopathic medicines and how they overlap with the classic uh, medications. And I'd also just say beware of the extreme diets because you, your diet needs to be able to function to heal your body. So how do you do this? So if you're deciding to go see a naturopath and so on, you know, the same way you want to, you know, if you're going to buy a new car, you'd want to do your research and understand who you're working with. So you're asking, who, like, what are the credentials of that person? Where do they train? What's, the, what's their background? How much are they delving into the science of this? And that, that leads right into the next issue of what's the benefit? You know, what's the quality of the evidence, you know, from... Uh, you know, I've treated some people and it really helped them to, you know, there was a randomized trial in which half the people got this uh, treatment, half the people didn't, and we followed them for X period of time and there was a benefit for those who got the treatment. So, and then along with that is to understand what is the toxicity of the treatment. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and does it interact with other medications? So... What is the benefit? What is the risk? What is the total cost? What is the plan? You want to go in with kind of eyes uh, open. Kind of thing. So bottom line is you can make a tremendous difference in your health by empowering yourself, um, getting the best care from the medical system and, um, and you know, empowering levels of body, mind, and spirit, using your research or intuitive mind to figure out what works best for you. Uh, to make a difference. So, so I, think, I think I'll finish the um, uh, presentation there and then we can take uh, questions maybe after the break. So thanks folks for, for listening in to this uh, first part of the lecture.